Welcome to the Serif Podcast, where we interview people pushing industrial businesses forward. This includes operational experts, those investing in and financing new businesses and new product lines, as well as specialists with unique insights to help navigate some of the most difficult points in a business's lifetime. Today, I'm thrilled to present our first guest, John Stewart of Middle Ground Capital, a middle market private equity firm that specializes in B2B industrials, manufacturing, and specialty distribution. John's a founding partner, and he's responsible for overall management of the firm. Middle Ground is operating out of its second flagship fund and has over $2.2 billion in assets under management. If you're in the automotive supply chain, you're probably familiar with some of their holdings like Plasmin, Shiloh, and Dura, but they also hold distribution companies. They even have a precast concrete manufacturer. I wanted to bring on John because as private equity matures and more capital and firms enter the market, it's gotten a lot more competitive. Firms no longer can do what they did in the 80s where it was about financial engineering. Companies are looking to underwrite their investments through a series of operational improvements. And Middle Ground has a unique way of doing that. And you probably won't find many other firms with this commitment to operational excellence. So without further ado, you'll hear John and me discuss just some of the ways that they're approaching investing and developing companies. Let's get into the interview. Hi, John. Thanks for uh, joining us on the, the podcast today. Really excited to talk with you about Middle Ground Capital because I, I looked at a lot of private equity firms, especially in the industrial space, and Middle Ground stood out pretty unique as, as it's both its approach and that it, it's worked with a number of automotive suppliers, which is rare in the PE industry. So thanks for coming on. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Can you share a little bit about how you got into private equity and uh, then lead into the, the thesis for middle ground capital? Sure. In my background is I started my career working for Toyota Motor Corporation, uh, actually started as an hourly line worker on the night shift at their plant in Georgetown, Kentucky. A lot of people don't know it, but that's Toyota's largest facility in the world. I started uh, putting bumpers on the Toyota Camrys, and over an 18-year career, I um, worked uh, my way through management, was uh, promoted successively throughout the organization, completed my undergraduate degree, and ended up stationed in the United Kingdom running their operations uh, over there. So that was in 2005, 2007, I was in the UK. I was contacted by a recruiter that was recruiting for a um, new private equity firm that had spun out of another firm that was focused on industrials. They had owned some companies that in the industrial space at their prior firm and some of those firms had used uh, lean manufacturing or the Toyota production system uh, processes in their facilities. And they recognized those as superior, you know, methods and those facilities had performed better for them. So they set out to look for somebody with that background. I had done a lot of public speaking at Toyota and uh, was highly trained in the Toyota production system. I actually authored a book on lean manufacturing. They contacted me through a uh, headhunter and I joined them in uh, 2007. Uh, I was interested in making a move out of uh, big corporate culture. I'd been there for 18 years. I started when I was young. I was 20 years old when I started. I was 38 when I left and uh, I was looking at the next chapter of my career. I was interested in going to maybe a smaller company doing something a little bit more entrepreneurial. I was familiar with private equity because a lot of our suppliers have been acquired by private equity firms. And so it was an interesting concept. I'd never visited New York City before, uh, before I went to my interview in December of 2006. So I ended up joining that firm in March of 2007. So I moved my family back to the U.S., started as an operating professional on the operating team working with their portfolio companies. And then over a 10 year career with them, uh, very similarly, I kind of learned the business uh, from scratch. Uh, became the head of their operations team, then became a managing director on the investment team and started leading transactions, became a partner in their firm. And then as a lot of private equity firms do, as they start, you know, being more successful, their strategy started to shift. You know, they started out, they were doing distressed turnaround and then post the great recession, there weren't a lot of turnarounds. So we kind of morphed into a good to great industrial strategy. And then as they raised more capital with their third fund, they wanted to become more of a generalist value buying shop. And so I left with um, uh, Scott Duncan, who was uh, with me at uh, Toyota Motor Corporation. Uh, Scott came up on the engineering side and I came up on the manufacturing side. So he'd worked with me for nine years at the prior firm. And then our other partner, uh, Lauren Moholland, was on the transaction team side. And so we left and started Middle Ground in uh, 2017, really with the idea that we wanted to stay focused on industrial. Uh, that's mine and Scott's background. That's where we had a, a lot of success. 
Um, in the deals that we led, in the time that we've been leading deals, we've never lost money on an industrial asset. So we've got a really good track record of buying companies, really uh, good companies, and then just making them better using some of the principles that, that we've acquired through the years. So we started Middle Ground in May of 2018, really with the idea of being focused, North American headquartered industrial B2B and specialty distribution acquirers, uh, really with an operations first principle. So with, you know, two of the three founding partners having deep operational backgrounds, it's just a different way of kind of uh, looking at the world. And uh, a lot of uh, investors want to, they do want to directly invest with operators. And so it gave us some differentiation in the market. So we look at industrial B2B, specialty distribution, try to stay focused on the lower middle market. We look for good companies that historically have grown in line with their core markets, but that uh, have really good products. So we try to stay away from commoditized products. We try to stay with highly engineered components, but we're really looking for a good business and how to make it better. And typically what lines up well with us is a company that historically has grown and has good gross margins, but their uh, net margins are really not what they need to be. And there's some opportunities, some underperformance in the business. And we look at every line item of the P&L balance sheet when we go through and are working uh, through our um, uh, uh, filtering of companies to develop something that we call a value creation plan. And that's really the big filter for us on how we select the types of businesses that we're going to acquire. Yeah, that's really rare that somebody has, that might be one of one starting on a production floor as a private equity firm founder. So I could definitely see how that that's a pretty differentiated product for your limited partners at your firm. In that value creation process, you're bringing operational background, what are some of the, the ways you typically are looking to improve your companies once you buy them? I noticed that you seem to have adjusted some of the product portfolios across the companies you bought. Um, notably, uh, it looked like there was some change in between Plasmin and Dura and Shiloh and Mentler. Are, how, how do you think about both um, operational improvement as well as using multiple acquisitions to build new companies. Yeah. So in, uh, so it's a couple of ways. One is we touch every line item of the P and L balance sheet to our value creation plan. So looking at working capital management, which the kind of just in time principle of, of Toyota manufacturing and, and, and keeping low inventories and reducing waste out of the process are right. able to use that to generate a lot of free cash flow at the businesses. And then on the P and L side, we've just over 15 years of investing in private equity. We've become really good at like knowing how these individual small facilities operate. And so a typical facility be 50 million in revenue, hundred thousand, 150,000 square foot facility that if you're driving up and down the highway, you see it numerous industrial parks across the Midwest and, and other areas. So there's, you know, there's literally thousands of opportunities out there for us, but we've kind of refined the skill set, and so that we can like uh, identify these things prior to buying the business. And we look for the things that we're going to execute, the things that our team has the capability to execute to drive 25% or more of the return. And so what that does is it re reduces our reliance on debt, but typical plain vanilla private equity LBO sponsor is they're going to want to put 35, 40% equity in a deal and then finance the rest of it. I've been doing this for 15 years. And the only way that you can really lose money buying heavy asset uh, businesses like industrial companies is to put too much leverage on them. The chances I'm going to buy a company that in five years, their products are going to go out of favor with their customers is zero. It's not going to happen. And the chances that we're bad operators and we're going to run a company into the ground is zero. It's just not going to happen. We're, we're really good at what we do. So we try to like focus on reducing risk in these transactions by underwriting more of what we can do in the value creation plan as a way to create equity value, which takes pressure off us having to use leverage to create as much of the return. And so we'll typically put 50, 60, and we've done a couple of deals. The Dura deal we did with 100% equity at close. In Shiloh, we did with 80% equity at close. Because of our operational capability, we can put a lot more equity to work in the business, still underwrite to private equity like returns and create a lot of value, but also take a lot of risk out of the transaction because now with a very little debt on the business, there's not a lot of things that can go uh, wrong that can that we could lose control of the business. We have a zero tolerance for zeros at middle ground, so we don't want uh, any of our you know portfolio companies uh, have the, hand the keys over to the banks, and so we self-select away from that. So 
that's part of our core strategy is to look at all those items. About a third of our team are operating professionals like myself, uh, people that have run facilities, that have run operations. And so that's one of the fundamental things that we do different than everybody else. A lot of private equity firms, you'll have a, a VP or a director on the investment team that's 27, 28, 29, 30 years old, that's leading the transaction and post-close, they're on the board, they're trying to give advice to the CEO and everything in the company, but they have no business experience. They have no practical experience. For us, we we don't manage that that way. We manage differently. The people that are working and giving advice to the CEOs or people that have actually operated these companies and these facilities. And so it's it just a really different dynamic. Our CEOs look at our team as like a resource to help them to execute and not people that are just kind of like managing the numbers and looking for explanation. And so from a core, from an operational standpoint, we help to build like excellence into everything that they do so they can deliver on the commitments. And so if you can do that, then when you start to look at the commercial side of these business, where it's, whether it's in the automotive, which we have done some investments in automotive or any other kind of industrial end market, what we do is we try to partner with management teams that are experts in the industry. And, and we'd like to say we like bringing a lot of expertise to the table, but we're not the experts. So we try to hire and have management teams that are the experts in their given industry. And with all the reps that we have on looking at these companies and, and owning these companies, that are maybe are manufacturing, delivering to different end markets, we, we can actually help to optimize their ability to deliver on the commercial strategy for the business. And then we bring a tool that we used at Toyota called Hoshin Conry, which is strategic planning to uh, the table. And we teach the, these teams how to think about the business and what it's going to look like five or 10 years from now and how to position it. And as you mentioned in the Dura, Durish transaction, we really transformed that business. When we bought the business, they were probably historically 60 to 75% of the business was uh, mechanical cables. So when you pull a, a hood release lever, there's a cable that actuates the, the uh, latch out in the front. You pull the trunk, there's a lever that does that. When you uh, roll the windows up and down, so you have all these switches all in levers. So there's all these cables, parking cables and all kinds of different cables in the vehicle. And as the industry's moved to more electric actuated motors, uh, a lot of those cables have become like less, uh, the cars are less reliant on these cables, even like electric shifting and electric actuated brake pedals and, and fuel uh, pedals, accelerators and so forth. And so the business that was seeing their cable business decline. And when we bought the business, uh, they had just won a large contract uh, with a large OEM to produce battery trays uh, for electric cars, but they had no experience producing these trays. Uh, they had three facilities that needed to be built in the depth of COVID two in Europe and one in North America. And so we, we, uh, bought the business. We, uh, um, closed the transaction with hundred percent equity because we needed to invest $250 million over the next two years to build these one of a kind facilities. And, and then we got to work, you know, doing that, but we were able to have the vision to see what the business could be after those battery tray facilities were up and running and how the mix change was going to be in the business. And so we started looking at how we could divest some of the non-core assets to generate cash flow to pay for the investments that needed to be made for the future of the business and, and really position that business for the future. And so again, that's a formula that we kind of are willing to go through. And there's a lot of sweat equity that comes in that because there's a lot of work that has to be done. And so to look at a business that may be doing a billion dollars of revenue and find this 300 or $400 million revenue pocket inside of it, that's really interesting and has like a real value to it. But then working with the rest of the business to kind of clean it up, if you will, so that you can uh, position the business so that, you know, they're using the cash flows from sometimes declining businesses in order to fund future operations. Yeah, it, it sounds like you're somewhat in a, a a space that not many others can play in because they don't have the same operational confidence that you do, that when you go out and you make a five-year plan, that doesn't just involve cost cutting, it involves uh, reshaping a, a business through operations. You're in a, a league of your own. I, I saw that Shiloh had a, a similar thing where you sold off your, was it its cast lights business to yeah. Aludine? So yeah. Filling off one part of the business to fund investment in future higher growth area. So that way you don't need to take on as much debt and you can focus on using debt in the transaction. You can focus on maybe using debt or selling off a business to, to fund 
future expansion. Am I, am I getting it right? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. And Alco, I mean, um, sorry, uh, Shiloh is a good example of that. You know, that was in, in the depths of the recession. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, of COVID uh, that we bought that business. What had happened is Shiloh was a public company that was doing about $95 million of EBITDA pre-COVID. They had racked up over $500 million of debt because they were a public company and they were chasing revenue. So they had acquired a lot of uh, casting assets that had a you know legacy in the industry of really being kind of problem individual facilities. They had good revenue to them and they even had good earnings, but it required a lot of CapEx to maintain those casting operations. And we had owned a casting platform in our prior firm, so we we're very familiar with the assets. And when we acquired the business, we, we were able to drive a lot of value just through the process of the bankruptcy and it being the middle of COVID and not a lot of people being able to pull off a transaction like that. But when we closed the transaction, we only uh, closed the deal with $41 million of debt and put 170 plus million dollars of equity to work in the transaction. And so you, here's a business that was doing 95 million of EBITDA that had declined to about 40 million of EBITDA in the depths of COVID, found itself 10 times levered, went through a bankruptcy process. And instead of using, we could have raised three or four times leverage on the asset if we wanted to. And it was still doing, at the time we closed the transaction, about 50 million of EBITDA. We didn't go out and, and take all the debt that we could because we were in the middle of COVID and we didn't know what was going to happen in the automotive build at that time. And we didn't want to put that pressure on, on the company. So we over equitized the deal uh, and were able to do that because of the operational skill set that we brought to the table and the things that we knew that we could do to drive value in the business. And that's a great story for us because we uh, bought that business in November of 2020. And by April of 2021, we returned to 2X on that $170 million uh, equity that we put in the deal. And so, um, uh, we sold off two non-core divisions of the business. We sold off the cast light division and we sold off the uh, a blank light division uh, to two strategics. And through that, we returned almost uh, twice as much as we had put into the business. And um, and then once we got it kind of down to what we really liked, which was the stamping component of the business, which had really good free cash flow generation, had been over and under invested in through the years. Uh, and then we uh, sold off some non-core assets of Dura. We actually combined those two businesses into our new Shiloh platform today, which is one of the leading providers of structural solutions, including battery trays uh, for new electric vehicles, which there's very few of those facilities in the world. And, and we've invested over $250 million building those new facilities uh, over the last couple of years. So we're really excited about that platform and its future uh, for success. Yeah. One of those is in Alabama, right? Yep. Yep. In uh, uh, Muscle Shoals, Alabama, we just opened a facility there. Uh, we have one in uh, North Macedonia, in uh, Europe, and then in the Czech Republic. Yeah, that, that's interesting. What are some of the ways that you think that whether it's public companies or other uh, private equity backed companies, or I guess in the rare case, a, a family owned business that, that's going to put it into your hands? What are some of the mistakes that you think operators are making running industrial businesses right now. It, it sounded like you said that for Shiloh, they were chasing revenue growth because they're a public company and using lots of debt for that. Is that the primary way that, that a business um, gets itself in a difficult position, despite it, it having a, a solid core that, that would maybe make it, um, the, the right place for middle ground to, to maybe have an opportunity at it in the future, not to. Yeah, so like, yeah, like clear. So we those were two examples of companies that were in like stressful situations. We typically don't do uh, distress turnaround. Uh, we'll do like a bad balance sheet, but a good company, so positive EBITDA, positive cash flow. So we're not really like looking at like the real heavy turnarounds. But I can tell you, after 15 years of doing this, I've never bought a business where anybody, where the owners, the CEOs, the CFOs, where they actually know where they make money. So they, they may have the gross margins and everybody manages to that and, and they have their standard costs, but the company's not operate to the standards. They haven't rolled standards in years. There's millions of dollars of variances running through the P and L. And as long as the outcome at the bottom is acceptable, nobody's really digging into the weeds and the detail. And so many times we'll buy a company and we'll find out that their largest customer is not profitable. So when you look at like the amount of overhead that's focused on that customer. 
the number of meetings that they have, and all they do is talk about that customer's needs and what they need, and it's really causing all this disruption inside the organization. They're, they're doing it for really narrow margins because typically their largest customer is really sophisticated and they're squeezing them. And so they have really narrow margins and with fluctuations in material pricing, with, with um, the difficulty of obtaining labor today, uh, with the, the disruption in the supply chain, there's all of these things that are going on and nobody quantifies the cost of those. And so your winners, which are probably some of the lower volume, the mid volume uh, uh, programs are covering all of the losses of the, of the big customers. So they're basically supplementing your largest customer. And so that's no way to run a business, but we, we dive in and do a uh, product profitability analysis. And we, we actually like take those variances and we allocate them to each of the line items in the P and L and we help educate the management team. Once we take them through the process and we're able to work with that, with them, then yeah, they, they can make the right decisions. Like they know the right decisions to make, but it's having the sophistication and having the systems available to, to get to that level of degree of detail in the analytics to know where you're actually making or losing money. Of course, once they kind of see the picture, then they want to take action and they're able, uh, for the most part to take action in those scenarios, but just teaching uh, and making sure that the management team at the business really knows where their money is being made and don't get tricked just because this customer gives you so much revenue and all these different things into thinking that they're, they're a great customer. They're a great customer. If you can make a profit and, and you can uh, support your organization, uh, that's a great customer. Um, and it's not about gouging the customer. It's not about anything about that, but it's about being fair and doing business in a fair way. And so I think the biggest mistake I see people make is not understanding like where they actually make money in the business, where they're, where, where the cash flow is being generated. Maybe that customer, maybe they generate 50 or 75% of your EBITDA, but they consume hundred percent of your CapEx, right? And so now you got to look at it based on what, for, what good does it do to have somebody that generates $75 million of EBITDA, but has $50 million of CapEx, like that, that, that free cash flow formula doesn't work for anyone. So really understanding that and how to manage that uh, situation, that's one of the areas we'll tell the management teams, we have a lot of expertise. We've managed through these things in the past. We work with very sophisticated uh, customers and vendors. And again, when you sit down with all the data and the facts, and you can sit down with your customer and you can show them the facts and the data, and they're not going to argue with you about that. They probably, one of the questions are probably wondering themselves is why weren't you coming to us sooner? with this as a problem. So I, I think that's one of the biggest problems that we see. I think a, another problem that I see in the industry right now is people aren't preparing for the labor shortage that is coming. There is a labor shortage in manufacturing right now and our governments, and I'm a big believer that we don't wait on the government to solve our problems. Uh, they're just not capable. Like they can't even agree on like anything for them up in Washington, like, let alone anything that matters for us here in the working class. And so uh, people that have uh, positions of authority, leadership and business can make more of an impact than anyone can. And so it, when you look at the labor situation right now, it's a pay prop, like in manufacturing, having people making the same amount of money, manufacturing a product or working at Taco Bell, it just, that doesn't make sense. And nothing against people that work at Taco Bell, but asking you if you want churros with your order and operating a CNC machine requires a whole different skill set. And so we have a big initiative where we're pushing internally to get the lowest wage in our portfolio to $25 an hour by 2025. And the way that we're doing that is not just paying people more, but we're actually using automation. And so looking at ways to automate these processes, uh, there's probably in our portfolio alone, there's probably two, three, 5,000 applications where every, someone every day, all they do is load and unload a CNC machine. And that's all they do is all day long. They're unloading, loading it. The technology has been around 50 years to automate that. And so people look at like a payback analysis and say, well, can we get a payback analysis? Well, there really is no payback analysis if you can't hire people to do the process. So you, you have to do it. And so this automation, this kind of wave of automation that needs to be happening right now in manufacturing, it's going to be the differentiator between people that are addressing that issue and looking at it head on today and people that aren't because they're not going to be able to get access to the labor. 
you're not going to be able to infinitely kind of push the rising cost through to your uh, customers without innovation and without doing these things. And so I think there's like a big bubble uh, that's getting ready to come when the economy does start to take off again and you start to see volume start to be, uh, build and you start to see the supply ch uh, chain be less disrupted and the inventories return to normal, you're going to see this massive labor shortage that nobody's preparing for. And uh, people are talking about the labor shortage today, but think about what that's going to be five years from now. And if the business, if your business isn't preparing for that today, then you're going to, you're going to be finding yourself in a, in a real big mess. Something we've seen a lot on our projects is uh, you walk into the HR and they, they do describe that they're, they're losing to the, the Culver's or the Zaxby's or exactly. whatever else you know, <laughs> down the road, which uh, it, it is up to the, the business owner to be able to create a better opportunity for workers. And yep. that's, yeah, I mean, think about it. So you got you got, you got three people that are running CNC machines, right? You're paying them 15, $20 an hour, right? And you're competing with Zaxby's and everybody else. And at Zaxby's, they don't have to work from 11 o'clock at night till eight in the morning, right? They don't have to work the third shift. And so of course I, I'm going to go work at Zaxby's if that's the case. And, um, cause again, that that's just an unsustainable uh, system, but you got these three people making $20 an hour operating these CNC machines. Well. There's no reason that you need a person to operate the CNC machine. The machine does all the work by itself. You just need someone to load and unload, maybe inspect the part. Well, there's, there's automation solutions for that today. And if you automate that process, probably that company's facing rising demand, but they just can't hire the people, but you can probably still buy the CNC machines. So you now, if you automate and you get, or one person can run three machines, it's not about laying the other two people off. It's about using those other two people to buy six more CNC machines and now use three people to generate nine times the revenue. And now you can afford, but you were paying $60 an hour for those three machines. Now you can raise the labor to 25 or $30 an hour. You can train that worker how to operate that uh, automation and that equipment and that process. So you can increase your efficiency and you can raise the wages of your employees and you can train the employees, you know, how to do a more skilled job. And so those are the things that we're trying to teach our management teams. And if you're going to be ready for that in 2025, 2026, when this bubble, I think is going to hit, you got to start planning for it. Now you start, got to start addressing your standards. And right now there's a huge backlog with companies that do automation. And so we had a business uh, called Alco. They make um, hydraulic hose fittings for um, uh, hydraulic hoses. So we don't make the hose, we make the fitting. And um, for these products, uh, we're using uh, different kinds of mach screw machines or machining uh, CNC machines or hydromatic uh, machining centers. And um, we, we had this one process that required seven operators and we were trying to automate it. It was got a year lead time to automate it. It was gonna cost $250,000. The cost wasn't really the problem. But it was the time frame to do it because all everybody's trying to you know use more automation. So we took the solution differently. Being the operators, we started our own automation team. So right outside my headquarters here in Lexington, Kentucky, we have a twelve thousand square foot fab shop. We hired Toyota's automation team. Uh, so we've got a group of nine engineers and fabricators that design our equipment and these solutions. And they went in and in three weeks and for $35,000 did a solution that eliminated seven workers. Uh, now we weren't, we didn't have to eliminate the workers. We just redeployed them because we needed them because our volumes are increasing. But again, it's just another differentiator for us. I mean, I, I may be one of one of, as far as, uh, private equity, uh, partners that started their career as an hourly employee. I definitely know we're one of one when it comes to private equity firms that own their own machine shop and are making automation equipment that's going into their facilities. So again, we're not, um, we're, we're breaking the mold kind of in every way. And because we're so focused on just industrial businesses, we get, uh, can get really knowledgeable about these businesses and we can develop our own solutions. And so our automation team was helping our uh, companies and our CEOs, they love our automation team and they would, they, they wish that we had 90 people instead of nine because of the type of uh, work that they're able to do in these facilities. You answered the, the next question I was going to ask, which was about the, the system integrators, because uh, I, th that seemed like it would be a bottleneck going forward. Some of the, the companies you've owned, maybe it was the Shiloh example, that you already returned 2x 
on that by selling off some of the divisions and growing. As I'm listening yep. to you, it, it sounds like you're really well positioned to support a number of businesses. How do you think about hold structure now that you've maybe are able to get some returns by selling off parts of the business? I imagine the the operators, the CEOs, the leadership teams of your companies would be really disappointed to to lose access to the the middle ground support network um, during a, a sale process like most private equity firms do. I, I haven't yeah. actually looked at, at your your plans for exiting businesses, but I, I think this would be an interesting time to, to look at that. Yeah, look, I mean, we, we still have to sell our businesses to generate returns for our LPs, but we do some education programs. So on a quarterly basis, we actually teach uh, kind of lean manufacturing workshops uh, at our portfolio companies, and we've trained hundreds of of people across the facilities. We just finished one in the Czech Republic at one of our battery trade facilities uh, over there. And so we've got a, a team of resources that that can do that training. And and so we're trying to teach these businesses as well and then get the right leadership in place so that they can continue to do these things on their own. And so we usually are very intense for the first kind of nine to 18 months we own the business. And then at, during that time, we're also trying to make sure they have the right leadership teams to keep these things going on an ongoing basis. And then once we're able to anniversary those results and, and we're able to continue to make improvements, what we are, what we really try to do is, um, uh, we try to, uh, let those businesses sustain themselves. And then we start to look at what are the strategic options. And so it's not always about exiting. Sometimes we can return capital. We can de-risk the transaction even more, uh, take more money off the table, but we're not afraid to double down if it's a good investment. And we can make more money by holding it. Look, I got a fiduciary responsibility to maximize returns for my shareholders. So I got to look at what's best for them ultimately. And in a market right now where leverage is tight and the leverage market is is uh, is really tightening up. And so it makes things a little bit more challenging for some firms. Uh, we've been able to stay active uh, and we're uh, in the process of uh, exiting two of our businesses right now. But um, I would say on average, we're going to hold a business for about five years. Uh, typically we're going to look in the first 12 to 18 months, if there's add on acquisitions that we need to do to diversify, if there's non-core assets, we need to sell in the business, if there's new management teams, we need to bring in, if there's things that we need to do, we're going to try to do that heavy lifting in those first couple of years, uh, then really position the business for the future, give the management team some runway to run, uh, as far as a, a winning new business and creating a nice backlog for kind of the newly established platform and kind of prove out the thesis for the business. And then once we've done that, then it's time to take it to market and look for an opportunity to, to uh, realize a return. Well, the businesses that haven't been investing in automation and are going to be surprised by that bubble you talked about where they're really just not going to have a workforce or going to be forced to essentially raise wages until no profit and then uh, I, I'm not exactly sure what the implication is for that. What do you think will happen to those those businesses that either operationally efficient or or automating in the right way a couple of years from now, especially in uh, something like automotive, where where there are established contracts with customers for multiple years already set up? How do you think those businesses will function? Will they just be unprofitable within larger companies, or will will there be a lot of opportunity for private equity firms that are able to do? Turnarounds, yeah, right. yeah. I mean, look, I, I think I think you're going to see. I think you're going to see because of the current economy. I think you're going to see that happen. That the it's going to get forced the issue for some of them because of the tight liquidity markets and the reliance that people have had on a lot of leverage in their transactions uh, and the supply chain disruption. Now the recessionary environment that we're in, all of these things are putting more pressure on these uh, companies. The the foreign exchange fluctuation. Everybody thinks that a strong U.S. dollar is a great thing, except when you're a multinational corporation and you got 60% of your sales in Europe or something like that. It, it causes a lot of uh, issues and problems in these businesses. Uh, and sometimes it, that's just enough. When you look at the majority of kind of tier one and tier two automotive suppliers, especially the publicly traded ones, they're operating at kind of sub 10% EBITDA margins. That's really slim. I, I, I don't want to own a business that like operates with 10% EBITDA margins. That's just not, I'm not interested in that. And, uh, people are like, oh, that's norm for the automotive industry. Well, no, it's not. I owned all kinds of assets that make 15, 20% EBITDA margins in the automotive space. Uh, and I think the whole perspective has to change it. 
at 10% EBITDA margins, you can't afford to invest in CapEx. You can't afford to have leverage on the business. You can't afford to do all of those things. So uh, I think it's really going to, uh, the the access to liquidity is really going to rattle things. I think uh, that's even before the labor market issues start to hit. The big challenge in the automotive industry that nobody's talking about, like no, there's no articles on this. No one's ta- discussing it. I, I uh, did an event for the um, auto show and it's one of the things I talked about, but all of these automakers and all these tier one suppliers, as the supply chain disruption has happened and we've liquidated the the inventory of finished vehicles in the market, generated massive amounts of free cash flow. And what did those companies do with that free cash flow? They paid out massive dividends. Some of them did buybacks on stocks. They did all of these different things. Where is all the capital going to come to replace all that inventory? Where is it coming from? Nobody's talking about it. I mean, think about the the trillions of dollars. I've, I, I estimate that it's probably north of um, $1.5 trillion to replace the finished goods inventory back to the level it was pre-COVID, the normalized inventory levels where we're used to like going to a car dealership and are actually being cars that you can look at. Like right now, you go to a car dealership, except for some of the people in the industry that aren't doing so well, you go to a car dealership, there's no cars, right? You can't, you can't buy a car, but that's not going to stay that way forever. The OEMs haven't changed their model. The OEMs need the inventory to, so that they can, um, manage the fluctuation in their manufacturing, right? Because the peak demand doesn't happen like consistently throughout the year. More people buy automobiles when the new models come out and then through the spring and the summer season than they do in the fall and the winter. And so you've got to have that inventory to manage the fluctuations. Well, no one in the industry is even talking about how much capital is needed to replace that inventory. And that puts a, a lot of pressure on the OEMs. And on top of that, now they have this record requirement to um, invest in technology for electrification. So the industry is like they've switched and everybody's going down the electrification pathway, like whether almost whether people want the vehicles or not, like everybody is going that direction. You watch the GM commercials, Ford, it's all about their electric vehicles. Now Chevrolet has the EV and Chevrolet kind of highlight it. There's been talks of spinning off the electric vehicle platform from the from the internal combustion engine. And so, but there's massive amounts of, of money being invested in the technology around electrification. You also got the connected car that's next in the pipe where people are investing. And then after that, you got autonomous vehicles, which is kind of, that trend is slightly reversed. It was kind of growing at double digits. Now it's down in the single digits, uh, but that trend is gonna continue. So you got the OEMs that have all these massive capital needs. They need inventory. They need these massive investments in new technology. And what are they going to do? Well, they have to partner with uh, tier one suppliers that have good balance sheets that can afford to, to invest and, and, and keep up with the technology shift. And so you're not seeing that a lot. If you look at probably, I would say, if you look at 90% of the public tier one automotive uh, suppliers, I would say that 75% or more of their revenue is coming from the internal combustion engine. And nothing is being done about changing that right now because the volumes on electric vehicles is still so small. It's never, it's not going to replace what's coming in from internal combustion engines. And, and, and now people are having to use that cash because they relied on liquidity. They're having to use a lot of that for interest expense, for amortization payments. There's still CapEx requirements to stay up with internal combustion engines. And, and so there's this massive liquidity bubble uh, that's going to happen even before we get to the labor problem that the original question was about, that the industry, nobody's talking about this. No one's talking about, like, what, where does this inventory come from? Like, wh- whose balance sheet does that come from? Who can generate that much free cash flow to afford to put all of that inventory on their balance sheet? And like, no matter how healthy you are, it's impossible to do that. Tesla with its like record valuation, they can't, uh, they can't produce them to put them in inventory anyway. So they, they have a whole different problem than the rest of the industry, but the rest of the industry can produce these vehicles. They can, once the supply chain clears up, but who's going to, who's going to fund the working capital build? Where that capital, where is it going to come from?
That's like a mystery question. I think that needs to get answered. Yeah. So you were uh, suggesting that there need to be more investments from the tier ones to help support. Um, uh, yeah. Did I, is that right? Yeah. But the problem is, is there 10% EBITDA margin businesses? I mean, the, where's the cash going to come from? So for years you look at, I'm not going to name names on here, but you can just go down through the tier ones, even the really well-known multi-billion dollar tier ones, they operate at razor thin margins. So 10% EBITDA margins on a hundred million or 500 million or $2 billion in revenue it is, it's not a lot to fund everything that needs to happen. I mean, you look at like Dura is a good example. We bought the business doing about 900 million in revenue and they were doing pre COVID about uh, per, uh, 10% EBITDA margins. So that's what they were doing. Well, they, they had to invest $250 million to build three facilities, just three facilities to service one OEM and one of the smaller OEMs, one of the European luxury OEMs to service their battery tray production. Imagine the investment that's needed to do it for the best selling vehicles on the road. You're talking like massive amounts of capital that have to be invested in this like technology. And we're still at the emerging landscape of electric vehicles. Like, are we still going to use aluminum for battery trays? Are we going to be using extruded aluminum, stamped aluminum? Are we going to be using cast aluminum? Are we going to be using steel? Because some people are still looking at using steel. Is there going to be some kind of composite material? Is there going to be some kind of plastic material? Like that, that all hasn't worked its way out. Like the industry right now, everybody uses plastic fuel tanks, right? So everybody used to use steel fuel tanks. Then it moved to plastic fuel tanks. Well, now we got this battery tray technology, $250 million just to build three facilities. Dura would have never had the ability to do that without middle grounds intervention. And their customer would tell you the same thing. We were on a call with them and they would tell you that there's no way that they would have been successful in launching their EV program if we hadn't stepped in and had the ability to fund that $250 million to build those facilities. But in order to do that, we had to require certain things of that customer that the OEMs aren't used to. So for example, we had to tell them like, you have to commit to volumes, your, your volumes, like whatever the volumes are in the year, we have to recoup that CapEx because we're funding it for them in advance. We have to recoup that on an annual basis, no matter what your volumes are. At the beginning of the year uh, in January, you remember the big debacle with Stellantis where their head of purchasing, they. They came out with their own terms and conditions and they said, we're not going to guarantee volumes. You can't hold us to our forecast and all that kind of stuff. And the, the industry gave them the middle finger and said, well, we won't give you any parts. Like they're, they're not a significant enough player. And we were one of the people that did the same thing to them and said, okay, well, if those are your terms and conditions, then we're going to be exiting all your business. And then what did they do? They made a huge leadership change in the, inside the organization. And now they're trying to reverse the damage that was done by that arrogance. And so the time of like the, the automobile industry, the OEMs having all the leverage in the industry from like the seventies and eighties, that's gone. The, the tier one suppliers that actually have the access to uh, cash to invest in technology, they have all the leverage in the industry right now because the OEMs can't fund this stuff on their own. It's impossible. Sounds like they're. The suppliers are also going to need outside financial partners um, because most yep. of them already yeah. have Yeah, and as you mentioned at the start of the uh, interview, that a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of private equity firms they take the book if it says auto and they just chuck it in the garbage, right? Yeah. That, you no, know, it's a cyclical business. The automotive industry is a wonderful business. We've made wonderful returns in all of our investments that we've made at my firm here and our prior firm in the automotive industry. You have to understand what you're doing. And again, automotive isn't all we do. It's only about probably 20% of our portfolio. Uh, but the automotive industry is a great business. What other industry do you get forecasts a year in advance from your customers that tell you how much volume they're going to need and, uh, and have that up every month? So you have this reliable forecast. I have businesses where we enter the month and we don't have any idea what our revenue is going to be for the month because we literally only can, are going to sell whatever it is at that time in the market. So. I know at that business, I would love to have a year of visibility from our customers. And so the automotive industry is a great industry to operate in. You have to know where to operate. And so one of the things that we did that's different than what we did at our prior firm is we started to really investigate some of these areas where there are macroeconomic items going on in the global economy, the regional economy, the local economy. 
and seeing where these where these are interesting areas where there's opportunity and there's growth, and then finding out how to get access to that. So we don't invest in just any uh, automotive business today. So we did we hired a third party. We did this ex elaborate research over a twelve to eighteen month period, and this was prior to everybody kind of you know getting on board with this. This was back in you know 2017, 2018 that we did all this work, but we really landed around. We want to invest around electrification, lightweighting, connected, and autonomous vehicles. And so we, that's where every investment we do has some of that element to it. And that's why we're kind of directing them in that future. So we're trying to take the core legacy business, either sell it off to generate cash to fund these new initiatives or use it as a kind of a renewable annuity of cash flow that is, can be used to fund the, the technology advances that the company needs, but they need to have products and technology that are already accepted by the customer in, in one of these four areas for us to invest in them. So we're like really disciplined investors. We're not just buying any asset. We were able to, to jump on the Dura opportunity that went through a, a, a bankruptcy process and the Shiloh opportunity that went through a bankruptcy process, but we were able to dissect those businesses and we were able to see like the back without the battery trade business, we wouldn't have bought Dura having that electrification uh, shift in their business was one of the main drivers. The lightweighting angle at Shiloh uh, was the main reason for plasmin, the lightweighting, a lot of the products now in electric cars that used to have to be metal because of the resistance to heat in the engine compartment or the exhaust can now be plastic products. And it takes a lot of weight out of the vehicle, which, which makes an electric vehicle or a hybrid more fuel efficient. And so, and, and uh, plasmins aligned with that and, and they are growing their business in that way. So all of these businesses that we've acquired have some, a one or one of these four trends that kind of dominates, maybe not where the majority of revenue comes from today, but where the majority of revenue will come in the future at that business. Yeah. It, it sounds like the industry will also need uh, a businesses that get really good at operating those internal combustion engine uh, businesses to be able to buy them off of the uh, businesses like the ones you've owned that, that are shedding them to invest in the future. So, so hopefully yeah. they're doing that as well. Uh, one kind of final theme that I wanted to touch on is I know you came out of uh, Toyota with a focus on just in time. I think this has been the last two years, it's 2022 20, now, and just in time has been difficult. It's been very difficult with some global supply chains that have been built out and then, yeah. uh, uh synchronization has been very difficult. How do you see that reshaping, if, if at all, over the next uh, decade as you're doing your uh, five, 10 year strategic planning? Well, short term, like this year, at the beginning of this year, we started holding more inventory than we need for the operations just to make sure that we weren't having the supply chain disruptions. And I think a lot of people have been doing that. So I think there's a short term pickup in, I would call raw material and component inventory. Um, uh, and so I think that that's going to still be the case. I think what you'll see is, is that the longer that we have to operate in this constrained environment, I think when we, when it gets time to go back to kind of normal inventory levels, I think you'll see the levels come down slightly. Uh, but I still think that in order for us to operate with the demand that we need, especially in automotive, we need the car inventory out there for people to select from. I mean, it, it's, it's pretty bad out there. I just, um, uh, uh, purchased a, a vehicle from Audi and uh, the stick window sticker had all these options on it. And then it had all these negatives that were, they just like, didn't have the components for like uh, the, the, the kind of uh, rear uh, sensors for like the uh, cruise control and everything. So that the distance monitoring and the advanced cruise control, and they just deleted it off of the window sticker and shipped the car without the products. Uh, the customers are going to put up with that for a little bit, but they're not going to put up with that forever. And so you're going to need to see these inventory levels kind of come back to uh, normal levels over the next three to five years. Uh, and it's going to take that long, I think, before inventory levels really get uh, to that level without there being like a uh, something happening. And it could happen in the next 12 or 18 months where demand really gets tamped down uh, because of the recessionary environment and the rising interest rates and fuel costs could really hamper demand, which could build up inventories that way. Um, but it's still going to require a lot of uh, consumption of free cash flow, and, and, and that's still going to cause a lot of stress out there. And so we're being very opportunistic in these markets. We uh, keep a list of 
public companies that we think that should be private in the automotive space, but also in the non-automotive space. I think it's a great opportunity to look for public to private transactions, uh, take people away from the dependence on the public markets. Uh, if a company's less than a billion dollars or even $2 billion of revenue, it really shouldn't be a public company. Uh, it, it should be a, a private business. And then with the influx of, of capital into the private markets, you know, that, that continues to grow. And as the private markets continue to do well, it continues to grow the, the portfolio for sponsors uh, and for um, ultimately for the investors, the LPs. Um, and then there's more capital to redeploy. So I think you're going to see more capital available in the private markets. And I think you're going to see more public to private uh, transactions. Uh, and really the, the private markets are even though there, I agree that there's there's some issues with some of the valuations in the private market space because of the amount of liquidity that's available to private equity firms, but I think it's more um, real uh, as far as value than what you see in the public markets. The things that go on the public markets, like if you look at the Dow Jones Industrial, there's not a lot of those businesses where the conventional model for what a company is actually worth, where it actually works anymore. Uh, and so there's so many things that drive the public markets that are, that are really just people's confidence in the brand, uh, than it is anything to directly tie to the results of the business. Well, thank you very much for, for coming on the podcast. This is definitely a lot for our audience of leaders and future leaders to, uh, chew on. This has been really entertaining and educational for me. So th thanks for sharing about your business and your experience. Appreciate it. Great. Uh, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to that conversation. I'm really grateful to John and his team at Metal Ground Capital for making that possible. Three main takeaways I had from that episode were number one, operations needs to be involved at the earliest stages of investment planning. It's not enough for them to be brought in after a deal has already been struck and a business case has already been developed. Many businesses have massive leverage that can be achieved through putting the right practices in place and restructuring operations in a way that allows a business to move forward much healthier and with greater opportunity for growth. The second takeaway is that labor is currently very constrained. And in John's estimate, that's gonna continue. We agree. In 2022 in North America, many manufacturing jobs just aren't competitive. In order for manufacturing and industrial employers to be able to compete, they need to think about how they're creating better jobs and better career paths for the people that work in their companies, all the way down to the entry level employee. This requires better systems and better management to allow for those jobs to pay at levels that outpace fast food, as an example. The third main takeaway is that businesses need to look at where they actually make money and re-examine their customer relationships. Revenue growth alone is not enough to sustain a business, and revenue growth at the expense of profitability is what will kill a company. So the way that John and his team are thinking about prioritizing customers and creating lasting, sustainable partnerships is really interesting. If you learn something from this conversation and want to make sure that you're able to hear future episodes we have coming down the pipeline, make sure to subscribe to this wherever you listen to podcasts. To learn more about us, you can visit us at Serif.com or on LinkedIn at Serif Consulting. Serif is a specialized global strategy and consulting firm that partners with business leaders to handle their most complex supply chain, operations, and manufacturing challenges. Leaders from across the globe come to us to solve their immediate problems and capture their biggest opportunities. We deliver long-term operational improvements by working with leadership teams from the plant floor to the boardroom, enabling our clients to transform their entire manufacturing operation. Thanks for listening, and I hope to see you on a future episode.